So the F5 is the uh, toe dip back into stoichiometry. Um, uh, for those of y'all at home, it wasn't on the slide, so I'm going to let y'all peek at it and pause so you can see the question. If it adjusts. Yeah, too hard to see. Oh, oh, oh. I didn't, I didn't get consent. I did consent yesterday. You got it. Uh, anyway, so pause so that you can uh, have the question and work it out with us here in a moment. All right, guys, so let's see if we remember some of these uh, stoichiometry basics. First off, though, what's the first step? Balance. Yeah, we have a balancing issue there. Um, so it looks like we will have four coefficients in order to balance this. Um, it's kind of a funky combustion one. If uh, you initially leave the first compound, the C2H6, with a coefficient of one and start to fix other items, uh, your brain would put a two in front of the carbon dioxide because that would fix the carbons. And it might also put a three in front of the water because that would fix the hydrogens. But one of the uh, more specific things that I hope that you can notice when looking at a combustion like this is that oxygen that we have as a reactant is always gonna give you an even number of reactant oxygens, no matter what you do. Whereas the oxygen on water at the very end is going to require what type of coefficient? It must be even, all right? You've gotta end up with an even coefficient over there if you're going to match an even total of oxygens on the reactant side. Anyway, this initial setup that I know is still ignored an entity has an odd number in front of that water, which is impossible. And one of the tricks we went over last year was if you see that happen, you can double everything. Which means if you go to two, four, and six, it will actually still have everything as balanced as you had made it so far. And now the oxygens are actually pretty easy to balance. If I have a four and a six as my two product coefficients. How many oxygens are there over here right now? There's 14. Therefore, there would be your balanced mole ratio. All right, so the stoichiometry, here's what it gave us. It gave us 48.8 grams of this guy, the ethane, and it wants to know how many grams of him, the water, is going to form. If you remember, we're always going to be starting with the given information, in this case, grams of C2H6. But one of our rules of our stoichiometry was that we had to have moles of the given. So right now we've got grams of given, but we can convert that directly to moles of given. The reason being is that the only direct comparison that we can make between two different elements is based off of a mole ratio. So this would go grams of known to moles of known. And once you know the moles of known, you can convert to moles of unknown. And some problems only want moles <laughs> of unknown. All right, but of course this problem wants you to go to grams of unknown. So. Remember, if you go across the top of your grid there, you can track the conversions that you're doing. Grams of known to moles of known to moles of unknown to grams of unknown. But you can't do that mole conversion unless, well, you've gotten to moles of known. Now, of course, 
the point of dimensional analysis is to make our units cancel out. So we can match the diagonals. Any questions about my basic unit setup before we add in numbers? Now, a couple things to remember. If you look at the bottom of the other whiteboard, I've reminded you of some conversion factors. All right, whenever you've got these different units over each other, it tells you what numbers you simply use. Keep in mind, though, that when moles goes over moles, the conversion factor we use to cross that gap of reactants to products is the coefficient. So if you need to glance over there for a reminder as we work this out, then do that. Now, we've got our given information here the 48.8 grams of ethane. And then when I look at my uh, analysis, whenever moles is compared to grams, I know that the number for moles is one and the number for grams is gonna be a molar mass. From the periodic table, does anybody have the mass of ethane for me? All right, if you went to 0.07, that's fine too. What about when moles is over moles, where do the values come from? The coefficients. The coefficients. All right, so from my balanced coefficient, so the uh, given coefficient, the ethane rather, was 2, while waters was 6. And now when grams is over moles, of course, moles is 1. And what is the mass of water from the periodic table? You get 18.02, basically. Yes. Your final step to solve your dimensional analysis, multiply across the top, then multiply across the bottom and divide those two products. Anybody want to shout out an answer? How many sick figs do you need? Three. Three. I get 87.7 grams. Go ahead and switch to your spirals so that we can make sure we're still good at the different forms that these stoichiometry problems can come in. Slides at home are now good. Make sure you have them in front of you. If you would, uh oh, she looked away and now I look like a freak. 
So a quick reminder on what stoichiometry is. By definition, a quantitative comparison of reactants to products. Um, the most important thing to always keep in mind is before we can do those conversions across the yield sign, we must have moles of known. So make sure that that is automatic for you. That's all right. I don't mind dancing. Um, so let's look at the, uh, the variations of our stoichiometry. One of them was limiting reactants. If you remember by definition, the limiting reactant is the reactant that stops the reaction. It's the one that you run out of. The reactant that you don't run out of is referred to as the item that is in excess. Um, the excess will actually be more important in this class than it might have been for you previously because it turns out that reactant that's still floating around in the solution after the products are made is going to impact things like pH and other stuff that's going to be real important for us to look at. So um, the excess and the limiting reactant are, uh, are both equally important. Um, the general way for you to identify a limiting reactant was to run an analysis on both of your reactants to figure out which one produces less product. All right, do you remember when we made cake in here? That was the analogy I used over and over again. All right, whichever of your starting reactants made less cake, less product, uh, was the limiting reactant. So it was that smaller number that mattered. So let's take a look at a baby problem because this one is pretty much as simple as it can go. Oh yeah, no, they're there. But look at that, you saw the symbol though. Sorry, I won't fire you yet. You get a couple of fractions. Um, sorry that the subscripts are not um, subscripted. But anyway, um, so we've got potassium sulfate reacting with barium chloride here. I know that it's already balanced because I see a coefficient somewhere. Remember, I'll never partially balance a problem. So if there's no coefficients, always go check it out. But if you see a coefficient somewhere, you're good. Um, so you'll notice what's happening here, though, is it's giving us nine moles of one of the reactants, potassium sulfate. And then it's giving you 10 moles of the other guy, barium chloride. Now, remember, a lot of times a limiting reactant problem won't dictate a product for you. If it doesn't tell you which product it's really interested in, then you can pick either product and just make sure that you analyze both of your reactants to that product. But in this case, that uh, it's kind of in the middle there, but it's supposed to be to the KCL. It wants to know how many moles of KCL will form. All right, therefore, this grid that we're about to build must both go to that potassium chloride. Now, what's the really good news that you can see in this problem? It's already in moles. And not only is it already in moles, what does it want us to go to? The moles. Moles, all right. Again, I'm starting us off with a problem that you probably don't even need to do a grid. You can just see the answer. But for teaching's sake, I already have moles of known, so I can go directly <coughs> to moles of unknown, in this case to moles of potassium chloride, and that'll be in both grids. Make that diagonal go. Gio, do you want to walk in front of the camera and wave? Or tell everybody goodbye. No fun. Um, hey, look, it's mole over mole. Where will the values come from? The coefficients, all right, and again, one of the reasons you could definitely see this is the uh, coefficients of both reactants, they're in a one-to-one -one ratio, but anyhow, the potassium chloride is sitting there at two. So this will give you moles of product so you can figure out how much potassium chloride will be made. 
What is the answer to the top grid? 18. 18 moles? Moles. And what's the answer to the bottom grid? 20 moles. 20 moles, 10 times, ow, 2 divided by 1. So which grid wins in regard to limiting reactant? The lesser one wins, all right? Which means this amount cannot be created because we would have ran out of eggs before we made that much cake, am I right? So this would be the answer. Hey, what, what do we call that answer? What, what's the, the vocab word for a stoichiometric answer? Uh, a theoretical yield. Yeah, this would be a theoretical yield. And what's the limiting reactant? It is this guy right here. Potassium oh. sulfate is the limiting reactant. Barium chloride is the excess reactant. So there's a lot of different questions that could be connected on, on depending on which of the information it wants you to submit. What do you think of this review? Easy. Okay, now I'm about to have you do one by yourself and I discovered something last class and I don't know why it was like this. Um, I drew cards for people to give me information after I give you six or seven minutes to work on this and I was drawing some bad desks, I guess, or something, because I wasn't getting good feedback. I was getting I don't knows. I'm about to do this thing where I walk around the room and I say, hey, if you get stuck, call me over, I'll help you out. That means like, I don't know, do that if you get stuck. Don't sit there and stay. This is the moment to not be lost. I'm here to help you, all right? So if, you, if you're not writing anything, I mean, the Murphy's Law is gonna have me pick your card if you've written nothing. Anyway, so. Let me help you during this time. Um, so work this out. This problem will require a grid. It won't be as straightforward as this one. Um, for those of y'all at home, it's ethane reacting with oxygen. I want you to find out how many grams of carbon dioxide will be made. Again, I know that it's, it's centered. I'm sorry, it just prints it bad. I want to know how many grams of carbon dioxide will be made. Call me over if I can help you. It's pentane, not ethane. I like to. Probably, probably a jump scare. <laughs>
Look at me real quick, look at me real quick. Coefficients only enter a grid at the mole over mole spot. Don't let them enter the grid anywhere else. Anywhere else it's just one, right? Okay. Yeah, so here's, here's what I see. Now that's working. You're right, those have to match. Mark, say that. I like the grid. No, no, no. You see how I have to put my hands in them?
lines are doing and now you need to mull it out. Carolyn really being an inspirational. Yeah, it's probably just the wrong one. It's probably fair. Is that not like the bottom screen? Yeah. But it's on just the top. Yeah. So I'm going to start getting work set up slowly. But see, it's good. They don't have to pause the video. They can just work it out because they know they have plenty of time. Right? Uh, no, no, you don't guess. You know. I just told you. OK. Um, so here's the deal. We're balanced. So that's good. It says that um, it, one of our grids is going to be analyzing pentane, which is C5H12. All right, and it gave me grams of that, while the other grid is going to be looking at grams of oxygen. Grams. Of oxygen. So I can start getting a couple beautiful grids ready. Now, it looks like I have grams of both of the givens, which is no bueno. All right, so I need my grams of pentane to be moles of pentane. Once I have moles of my given, I can go to moles of my unknown, in this case, carbon dioxide. Moles of carbon dioxide. And once you've got moles of your unknown, you can go to whatever you want of your unknown. You go to liters, you go to atoms, you go to molecules. In this case, though, it wants us to go to grams. All right. Now, my diagonal letters will match. So we're going to go grams of pentane. We're going to go moles of pentane. We're going to go moles of carbon dioxide. Are there any questions on the way that grid looks? All right. So same thing here. We need to go to moles of given. We need to go to moles of unknown. We need to go to grams of unknown. We want our units to cancel out through dimensional analysis. Hooray. My given value for the pentane was 238.7. while my given value for the oxygen was 294.4. We're looking for a limiting reactant. All right, we're looking for how many grams of carbon dioxide. Depends on what the question is truly asking. We're just practicing finding everything. Hey, look, moles is over grams. Anytime that happens, we use our conversion factors of one mole equals molar mass on the periodic table. All right, what's the molar mass of pentane, somebody? Uh, 72.146. Yes. All right, I meant to draw cards. I forgot. Okay, let's have someone else help. Let's go to cluster four, seat four. Aspen. Aspen, can you give me uh, the rest of the squares in the top grid? Can you just tell me starting with right there? Forty-four point what? All 
All right. Is that good? 44.08. I just my ears aren't great. All right. Hey. Oh one. Okay. Hey. The um, moles over moles was coefficient. Grams over moles was periodic table to one. Questions. Yes. The only time the coefficient shows up in your grid is when moles is over moles as its own number. All right, now there's another way teachers teach this where this step doesn't exist and you figure out the, use the coefficient within a different square. I just don't teach it like that. But if you have another way, y'all, I won't argue with your process. Let's go to 6-2 Aspen. Can you give me the top numbers for the next grid? Just the top one, straight across. All right, and then uh, you can pass Aspen over to cluster five. And let's go to, uh, and Aspen, you actually just got chosen again. Um, um, 32, and eight, and one. Any questions on where any of those values came from? Don't be shy. All right, so listen carefully to my next question. What's the limiting reactant? Oxygen is. Because oxygen, the oxygen grid produces what number? 253. what? Yeah, point 0.1, you're right. Four sig figs. All right. Hey, wh what number did the top grid? Just someone shout out so everyone else can feel good about themselves. 728? Yes. All right. So a number in the 700s for the top grid, but obviously the bottom grid was much smaller. The smaller number wins. So my pentane up here would be excess with that large number, but that large number wouldn't be created. This is the amount of product that would be made. in the end. What time do we have here? <laughs> awesome. All right. Um, percent yield is the other item that you are going to be schoologied on. So listen close because we are uh, up against the clock for sure. If you remember, this answer that I circled right there is a theoretical yield. What percent yield does is it says, okay, well, what if you're not just being a nerd on a whiteboard? What if you're really doing the lab? What would you actually get? And it would be a different number. If you remember, the theoretical number is always going to be a hopefully just slightly larger number than the actual because of a loss of energy or a possible experimental error while you're doing a lab. But in order to get an actual yield, you have to actually do a lab, which means a lot of the times when you're taking a test or something, it just has to give you a fake situation of someone doing a lab. And it says in the lab, they actually, they won't say it like that, but they got this number. What's the percent yield? Well, to find the percent yield, all right, and the equations up there, you'll divide the actual yield that somebody did while doing the experiment by the theoretical yield, how much they should have gotten if you do stoichiometry, times 100. Go ahead and show um, the first problem on the next deal, even though we won't have time to solve. Um, so on this percent yield slide with the practice problem, you'll see the copper two nitrate reacting. Notice that there's two numbers that are given in the problem. All right, it'll be your job to carefully figure out which one is the actual yield because if one of them is just reporting a number that someone else got in the lab, well, that doesn't need to go into a grid. That just needs to go into the formula, actual divided by theoretical times 100, because it's just giving you that number since you didn't do a lab. Of course, to find the theoretical, you would have to run a grid on the other number given, which is telling you what they started the lab with. It's a regular given number and then divide the two and multiply by 100. I'm gonna go ahead and link the percent yield lecture 
to Schoology as well. So if you do have any issue with this skill, 45 minute lecture going over it.